Section three of History of Egypt, Volume One by Gaston Maspero, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter One: The Nile and Egypt, Part Three. As the successive floods grow stronger and are more heavily charged with mud, the whole mass of water becomes turbid and changes color. In eight or ten days, it has turned from grayish blue to dark red, occasionally of so intense a color as to look like newly shed blood. The red Nile is not unwholesome like the green Nile, and the suspended mud to which it owes its suspicious appearance deprives the water of none of its freshness and lightness. It reaches its full height towards the 15th of July, but the dikes which confine it, and the barriers constructed across the mouths of canals, still prevent it from overflowing. The Nile must be considered high enough to submerge the land adequately before it is set free. The ancient Egyptians measured its height by cubits of twenty-one and a quarter inches. At fourteen cubits they pronounced it an excellent Nile. Below thirteen, or above fifteen, it was accounted insufficient or excessive, and in either case meant famine and perhaps pestilence at hand. To this day the natives watch its advance with the same anxious eagerness, and from the third of July public criers, walking the streets of Cairo, announce each morning what progress it has made since evening. More or less authentic traditions assert that the prelude to the opening of the canals, in the time of the pharaohs, was the solemn casting to the waters of a young girl decked as for her bridal, the bride of the Nile. Even after the Arab conquest, the eruption of the river into the bosom of the land was considered as an actual marriage. The contract was drawn up by a cadi, and witnesses confirmed its consummation with the most fantastic formalities of oriental ceremonial. It is generally between the 1st and 16th of July that it is decided to break through the dikes. When that proceeding has been solemnly accomplished in state, the flood still takes several days to fill the canals, and afterwards spreads over the low lands, advancing little by little to the very edge of the desert. Egypt is then one sheet of turbid water spreading between two lines of rock and sand, flecked with green and black spots where there are towns, or where the ground rises, and divided into irregular compartments by raised roads connecting the villages. In Nubia the river attains its greatest height towards the end of August, at Cairo and in the Delta, not until three weeks or a month later. For about eight days it remains stationary, and then begins to fall imperceptibly. Sometimes there is a new freshet in October, and the river again increases in height. But the rise is unsustained, once more it falls as rapidly as it rose, and by December the river has completely retired to the limits of its bed. One after another the streams which fed it fail or dwindle. The Takaze is lost among the sands before rejoining it, and the Blue Nile, well nigh deprived of tributaries, is but scantily maintained by Abyssinian snows. The White Nile is indebted to the Great Lakes for the greater persistence of its waters, which feed the river as far as the Mediterranean, and save the valley from utter drought in winter. But even with this resource, the level of the water falls daily, and its volume is diminished. Long hidden sandbanks reappear, and are again linked into continuous line. Islands expand by the rise of shingly beaches, which gradually reconnect them with each other and with the shore. Smaller branches of the river cease to flow, and form a mere network of stagnant pools and muddy ponds, which fast dry up. The main channel itself is only intermittently navigable. After March boats run aground in it, and are forced to await the return of the inundation for their release. From the middle of April to the middle of June, Egypt is only half alive, awaiting the new Nile. Those ruddy and heavily charged waters, rising and retiring with almost mathematical regularity, bring and leave the spoils of the countries they have traversed. Sand from Nubia, whitish clay from the regions of the lakes, ferruginous mud, and the various rock formations of Abyssinia. These materials are not uniformly disseminated in the deposits, their precipitation being regulated both by their specific gravity and the velocity of the current. Flattened stones and rounded pebbles are left behind at the cataract between Syene and Kenna, while coarser particles of sand are suspended in the undercurrents and serve to raise the bed of the river, or are carried out to sea and form the sandbanks which are slowly rising at the Damietta and Rosetta mouths of the Nile. The mud and finer particles rise towards the surface, and are deposited upon the land after the opening of the dikes. 
soil which is entirely dependent on the deposit of a river, and periodically invaded by it, necessarily maintains but a scanty flora, and though it is well known that, as a general rule, flora is rich in proportion to its distance from the poles and its approach to the equator, it is also admitted that Egypt offers an exception to this rule. At the most she has not more than a thousand species, while with equal area, England, for instance, possesses more than fifteen hundred, and of this thousand the greater number are not indigenous. Many of them have been brought from central Africa by the river. Birds and winds have continued the work, and man himself has contributed his part in making it more complete. From Asia he has at different times brought wheat barley, the olive, the apple, the white or pink almond, and some twenty other species now acclimatized on the banks of the Nile. Marsh plants predominate in the delta, but the papyrus, and the three varieties of blue, white, and pink lotus which once flourished there, being no longer cultivated, have now almost entirely disappeared, and reverted to their original habitats. The sycamore and the date palm, both importations from Central Africa, have better adapted themselves to their exile, and are now fully naturalized on Egyptian soil. The sycamore grows in sand on the edge of the desert as vigorously as in the midst of a well-watered country. Its roots go deep in search of water, which infiltrates as far as the gorges of the hills, and they absorb it freely, even where drought seems to reign supreme. The heavy, squat, gnarled trunk occasionally attains to colossal dimensions, without ever growing very high. Its rounded masses of compact foliage are so widespread that a single tree in the distance may give the impression of several grouped together, and its shade is dense and impenetrable to the sun. A striking contrast to the sycamore is presented by the date palm. Its round and slender stem rises uninterruptedly to a height of thirteen to sixteen yards. Its head is crowned with a cluster of flexible leaves arranged in two or three tiers, but so scanty, so pitilessly slit, that they fail to keep off the light, and cast but a slight and unrefreshing shadow. Few trees have so elegant an appearance, yet few are so monotonously elegant. There are palm trees to be seen on every hand, isolated, clustered by twos and threes at the mouths of ravines and about the villages, planted in regular file along the banks of the river like rows of columns, symmetrically arranged in plantations. These are the invariable background against which other trees are grouped, diversifying the landscape. The feathery tamarisk and the nampk, the moringa, the carob, or locust tree, several varieties of acacia, and mimosa, the saunt, the mimosa habas, the white acacia, the acacia parnixana, and the pomegranate tree, increase in number with the distance from the Mediterranean. The dry air of the valley is marvelously suited to them, but makes the tissue of their foliage hard and fibrous, imparting an aerial aspect, and such faded tints as are unknown to their growth in other climates. The greater number of these trees do not reproduce themselves spontaneously, and tend to disappear when neglected. The acacia seal, formerly abundant by the banks of the river, is now almost entirely confined to certain valleys of the Theban desert, along with a variety of the Colonel Dome Palm, of which a poetical description has come down to us from the ancient Egyptians. The common Dome Palm bifurcates at eight or ten yards from the ground, these branches are subdivided, and terminate in bunches of twenty to thirty palmate and fibrous leaves, six to eight feet long. At the beginning of this century the tree was common in Upper Egypt, but is now becoming scarce, and we are within measurable distance of the time when its presence will be an exception north of the first cataract. Willows are decreasing in number, and the Persia, one of the sacred trees of ancient Egypt, is now only to be found in gardens. None of the remaining tree species are common enough to grow in large clusters, and Egypt, reduced to her lofty groves of date palms, presents the singular spectacle of a country where there is no lack of trees, but an almost entire absence of shade. If Egypt is a land of imported flora, it is also a land of imported fauna, and all its animal species have been brought from neighboring countries. Some of these, as, for example, the horse and the camel, were only introduced at a comparatively recent period, 2,000 to 1,800 years before our era, the camel still later. The animals, such as the long and short-horned oxen, together with varieties of goats and dogs, 
are, like the plants, generally of African origin, and the ass of Egypt preserves an original purity of form and a vigor to which the European donkey has long been a stranger. The pig and the wild boar, the long-eared hare, the hedgehog, the ichnumion, the mufflon or maned sheep, innumerable gazelles, including the Egyptian gazelles, and antelopes with leer-shaped horns, are as much West Asian as African, like the carnivores of all sizes, whose prey they are, the wild cat, the wolf, the jackal, the striped and spotted hyenas, the leopard, the panther, the hunting leopard, and the lion. On the other hand, most of the serpents, large and small, are indigenous. Some are harmless, like the colubers, others are venomous, such as the soy-tail, the cerastes, the hajj-viper, and the asp. The asp was worshipped by the Egyptians under the name of Aureus. It occasionally attains to a length of six and a half feet, and when approached will erect its head and inflate its throat in readiness for darting forward. The bite is fatal, like that of the cerastes. Birds are literally struck down by the strength of the poison, while the great mammals, and man himself, almost invariably succumb to it after a longer or shorter death struggle. The uraeus is rarely found except in the desert or in the fields. The scorpion crawls everywhere, in desert and city alike, and if its sting is not always followed by death, it invariably causes terrible pain. Probably there were once several kinds of gigantic serpent in Egypt, analogous to the pythons of equatorial Africa. They are still to be seen in representations of funerary scenes, but not elsewhere, for like the elephant, the giraffe, and other animals which now only thrive far south, they had disappeared at the beginning of historic times. The hippopotamus long maintained its ground before returning to those equatorial regions whence it had been brought by the Nile. Common under the first dynasties, but afterwards withdrawing to the marshes of the delta, it there continued to flourish up to the thirteenth century of our era. The crocodile, which came with it, has, like it also, been compelled to beat a retreat. Lord of the river throughout all ancient times, worshipped and protected in some provinces, excrated and prescribed in others, it might still be seen in the neighborhood of Cairo towards the beginning of our century. In 1840 it no longer passed beyond the neighborhood of Gebet et Ter, nor beyond that of Manfalut. Thirty years later, Mariette asserted that it was steadily retreating before the guns of tourists, and the disturbance which the regular passing of steamboats produced in the deep waters. Today, no one knows of a single crocodile existing below Aswan, but it continues to infest Nubia, and the rocks of the first cataract. One of them is occasionally carried down by the current into Egypt, where it is speedily dispatched by the fellahin, or by some traveller in quest of adventure. The fertility of the soil, and the vastness of the lakes and marshes, attract many migratory birds. Passerine and palm pitties flock thither from all parts of the Mediterranean. Our European swallows, our quails, our geese, and wild ducks, our herons, to mention only the most familiar, come here to winter, sheltered from cold and inclement weather. End of section 3. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.